Good evening, friends. Uh, my name is Shinryu. Can you hear me okay out there? Great. So I know that um, on all of our minds recently uh, has been the war in Ukraine. And uh, I just noticed in the paper today, um, it, it reads, in the early weeks of Russia's invasion, at least 1,500 civilian buildings, structures, and vehicles in Ukraine were damaged or destroyed. More than 1,189 civilians have been killed, including at least 108 children. And these numbers are, are just abstractions. Um, it says uh, this devastation include included at least 23 hospitals and other healthcare infrastructure, 330 schools, 27 cultural buildings, 98 commercial buildings, including at least 11 related to food or agriculture and 900 houses and apartment buildings. Remnants of a missile were found in a zoo. At least one war memorial in the small city of Bucha took gunfire a car wash in Bereshivka, east of Kiev, was reduced to rubble. Onions spilled from a warehouse that was destroyed in Yokolayev, where several residential neighborhoods have been shelled to pieces, and the morgue has overflowed with bodies. So what's going on is extraordinary. And I know that there have been invasions and wars in Europe in the late 20th century, in the mid 20th century, in the early 20th century. And there are wars and invasions going on as we speak. And the United States has been involved in wars and invasions uh, very recently. But still, what's going on in Ukraine is extraordinary. Every conflict is, is specific um, and unique. There's also been debate raging about uh, the responsibility for the war. It's Putin's fault, or it's NATO's fault. And we have to grapple with all of these things, study the history and current events and the moral implications and uh, discuss it. We have to do all of this. But what else can our Zen practice bring to the situation? I wanted to share a koan with you called the National Teacher's Stone Lion. Goes like this, Nanyang arrived at the front of the palace with Emperor Suzong. Nanyang pointed at a figure of a stone lion and said to the emperor, your majesty, this lion is extraordinary. Please say a turning word. Emperor Su said, I cannot say anything. Will you please say something? Nanyang said, it is my fault. Later, Danyuan Yingzhen asked Nanyang, did the emperor understand it? And Nanyang said, let's put aside whether the emperor understood it. How do you understand it? I think uh, Nanyan saying it, it, that it's not Putin's fault and it's not NATO's fault, it is my fault. And there's something here for us to look at. And I think that Nanyang's teaching is actually um, exactly in the spirit of our Fusatsu ceremonies that we hold on the last Thursday of every month. Um, 
We call it a uh, ceremony of atonement. Traditionally, it would be called a repentance ceremony or confession ceremony. And we say atonement um, because uh, it is a, um, a ceremony of atonement. And the word atonement uh, we learned actually was invented in the 16th century by John Wycliffe, who uh, translated the King James Bible. And he invented this term to mean exactly that, to atone is to be at one with. And that's the spirit of our Fusatsu ceremony, to recognize our um, relationship to all of reality, and especially to the reality of suffering uh, in our world. And to see our relationship to that and our responsibility for that. So the ceremony, um, which involves lots of bowing and chanting, begins with a chant, the verse of atonement, which says, all evil karma ever committed by me since of old on account of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance, born of my body, mouth, and thought, now I atone for it all. And I think it's saying that I am at fault. Personally, in my individual and particular um, life, uh, I am not separate from all of the actions that cause harm. Evil karma could be the, the things that cause suffering. I'm not separate from that. Uh, I take responsibility for um, all of my actions from the most obvious to the most subtle, from the things that I do to the things that I say to the things that I think um, and the kind of harm that they cause that I'm aware of, that I'm not aware of. But if you listen to the verse, it's not only talking about the self in the particular personal individual sense, but also to the broader, the general, to the universal self. It says, uh, all evil karma ever committed since of old, on account of my beginningless greed, anger, and ignorance. There's a sense here that we're talking about all of the, the harmful action throughout time, without beginning, without end, right here, but also anywhere and everywhere. I atone for it all. I'm at one with it all. I'm not separate from any of it. But it's not, a, it's not an intellectual exercise. It's not a theoretical exercise. It's not an abstract <laughs> uh, recognition. From a practice perspective, it is also about experiencing that and living that directly. So how can we, how can we do that? How can we live that? Well, we throw ourselves completely and wholeheartedly into the ceremony, into our actions of chanting and bowing. And we try to let go of our ideas for a moment and our judgments and, uh, and lower our heads down for a moment and get in touch with the ground of reality. And we raise up our hands and receive reality and support reality as it is beyond our ideas of how it is or how it should be or our opinions about that. So, um, Enkyo Roshi gave a talk recently in which she uh, referred to a famous poem by W.H. Auden called The Musée des Beaux-Arts. 
which is based on a few paintings of Peter Bruegel that he saw in a museum in Brussels. And uh, I came across another poem about the image that she shared with the Sangha. And I'm, I'm gonna uh, share it with you again. If you can see that. And the, uh, the poem that I came across is um, one by William Carlos Williams, which refers to the same thing that Auden was talking about and that, that Roshi was talking about, which is the way in which uh, in our lives, we can be so oblivious to the tragedy and the suffering that goes on in our midst and all around us. So, uh, you remember the story of, uh, the, the poem is called Landscape with the Fall of Icarus. And the, the story of Icarus is that he was the um, son of Daedalus, the great craftsman. Uh, and he, Daedalus had made a pair of wings and Icarus strapped them on and in his great youthful ambition tried to fly up to the heavens. But he got so close to the sun that the heat melted the wax in the wings and the feathers fell out and Icarus fell out of the sky and into the water. So this is how uh, the William Carlos Williams poem goes. Landscape with the fall of Icarus. According to Bruegel, when Icarus fell, it was spring. A farmer was plowing his field. The whole pageantry of the year was awake, tingling, near the edge of the sea, concerned with itself, sweating in the sun that melted the wings wax. Unsignific unsignificantly, off the coast, a splash quite unnoticed. This was Icarus drowning. So uh, as Roshi said, this is, this is how we are. This is our human uh, condition. So much of uh, the tragedy and the loss is going on and we turn our backs to it like the shepherd in the painting. We miss it. Um, it's insignificant to us. It's unnoticed. And this uh, sense of being concerned with ourselves is the exact opposite, I think, of what Nanyang is saying. It is my fault. Or what our Fusatsu ceremony is saying. There's another uh, koan, uh, which I think is relevant here. It's short, it's simple, it's important, and it's also very difficult. Um, it goes, how can you stop the fighting on the other side of the river? Or we could say, how can you stop the killing on the other side of the ocean? So if, if you call out, hey, knock it off, it doesn't get to the bottom of the koan. You might even swim over the river and try to pull people apart and not get to the bottom of the koan. If we don't, if we don't see what Nanyang is saying out, it is my fault and I am not separate. It's, uh, it's so easy for us to separate. And we see the, the terrible things going on and we are, uh, we're full of ideas about it and uh, 
we point our fingers and we jab our fingers and we pontificate and uh, we rehash all of our old ideas about right and wrong. And in so doing, we reproduce the killing and the fighting. The first of the um, 10 grave precepts of the Bodhisattva uh, is talking about this. And the Zen Peacemaker Order said, the essence of this first precept is recognizing that I'm not separate from all that is. There are different ways we can, we can look at these precepts, work with them and use them. And one of them is just um, a very straightforward, literal sense. Just don't do it. The first precept is non-killing. So it means just don't kill, just don't fight. If someone uh, offends you or offends your honor or that of your partner or your community or your nation, don't fight back, don't kill in response. Even if you feel anger or uh, the urge or confusion, just restrain yourself, exercise some restraint. So this is a, a teaching that we really need in our life a lot of the time, given our greed and our anger and our ignorance. So it's a very strict uh, interpretation of the precept. We could say it's a kind of radical pacifism. And uh, we, we sometimes talk about this uh, strict interpretation as the Hinayana perspective. But, but the Hinayana perspective can be too rigid sometimes because as we all know, sometimes situations are complicated they're ambiguous. It's not so clear cut what's right, what's wrong in a given situation. And so we have to uh, be a little flexible. In some cases, you can't go right. <laughs> Whatever you do is going to cause harm. So then what do you do? Maybe you have to violate the letter of the precept in order to observe the spirit of the precept. What if you were in a situation where there were lots of people who were at risk of losing their life? Would it be justified to take life in order to save the lives of, of others? What would you do in a situation like that? So we have to, we have to be very careful here. We sometimes have to really bear in mind the, the context and the circumstances, what the moment is, what, the, what the, the place is, what the relationships are that are involved, what are the, uh, what's the degree of action that we're going to take. So this is a more, uh, a more flexible perspective. Uh, a relative perspective on the precept of not killing. We call this the Mahayana perspective. But both the Hinayana and the Mahayana perspective are still dualistic. And the deepest perspective on non-killing is the Buddhayana perspective. And from that standpoint, the precept of non-killing means there, there is no killing. There is no one to kill, no one who kills and no one who is killed. So uh, Bodhidharma said about this, self nature is subtle and mysterious. Not, not the personal individual particular self, but the universal self. Self nature is subtle and mysterious. 
in the realm of the everlasting dharma, not giving rise to the idea of killing is called the precept of not killing. So here we let go of any ideas about self and other, uh, right and wrong, killing and not killing, fault or no fault. And when none of those ideas and labels arise, um, there, is, there is no killing. But uh, we can't stick to any one of these, any one of these perspectives. The precepts involve being alive and responding to things, to reality as it is in a moment, in any given moment. Any one of these perspectives might be appropriate or inappropriate. The absolute perspective, if we're just twiddling our thumbs in the realm uh, with the idea that there is no one who's killing or being killed, then we could make a grave mistake. We also have to operate in the world and function. We have to discern and uh, discriminate and act based on our judgment. So what do we do faced with the situation in Ukraine. Tuesday night at eight o'clock, there's going to be a meeting with uh, some members of the Village Zendo and members of other Sanghas here in New York to organize a refugee relief effort for people from Ukraine, from elsewhere. That might be something you want to consider. Maybe you uh, need to have a conversation with a friend or family member or someone else, and you need to talk about what's going on uh, with the war. Is it possible to have that kind of conversation um, in a way that is not just, um, you know, grinding the old ideological acts that you have, uh, hauling out all of your old familiar ideas about Putin and NATO and the left and the right? Is it possible to come from a place in which you recognize that you are completely interdependent with the person you're talking to and respond from a place of no separation in which heart and mind are open because we let go of our ideas and labels for a moment. How can we do this? It's, it's extraordinary. How do you understand it? For my part, I'm going to have a conversation with the newcomers and then go make dinner. Thank you. <laughs>